Maranatha. Amen. Christ is coming. And that's exactly what we're going to be studying during this 13-part series. Amen? As Pastor Doug mentioned, we're excited to have this uh, weekend summit. Uh, for those of you that don't know, this is part of the AFCO uh, curriculum. We, we were developing, expanding our curriculum, both online and on-site. And so these, these presentations, these series that we're doing, not all of them, but at least this one today is part of that program as we're expanding and as we're, uh, we're wanting to get this message out as loud and clear as possible. And during these 13 presentations, we're going to be focusing on the events preceding the second coming of Jesus Christ. Who says amen to that? And now why is this important? Because sometimes I think we get a little bored with the topic of the second coming of Jesus Christ, right? Sometimes it's, well, again, again, and so we want to give that event, that glorious event that we're all waiting for, we have to give it its proper context. We have to study this deeply because it's not only about the event, it's about being ready for the event. Amen? It's about preparing for the event, and that's exactly what we are going to be talking about uh, for this first presentation. And so if anybody is interested in regards to our AFCO online curriculum or our AFCO, you can go to AFCO, A-F-C-O-E dot O-R-G, and you can get more information there. But since this is going to be a series on the three angels message, I thought let's start where the three angels message starts. So everybody, please grab your Bible and let's go to Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, that's where we're going to be studying and we're going to be focusing on during this, this, this series of presentations. Who's excited about this 13-part this series? Amen? It's like a, like a camp meeting, right? Revelation chapter 14, and the topic for today, or this first presentation, is called Thrust in Thy Sickle and Reap. Revelation chapter 14, is everybody there? Amen? Look at what it says in verse number 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the what? The everlasting gospel, the euanglion, the everlasting good news, amen? Or the everlasting plan of salvation. Who says amen? Woo! Says to preach to those who dwell where? On the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and... And people, right? This three angels message is, is the accompanying of this everlasting gospel that is going to be preached out to every single human being on this earth before the return of Jesus Christ. And there's, some, there's another parallel verse to this uh, verse that we just read in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. It's in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, and it says that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then what? And then the end will come. So when you ask yourself, what is the gospel of the kingdom that will be preached to all the world before the end? It's right here in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. It's the everlasting gospel. Amen? The everlasting gospel. The everlasting covenant. The good news of the covenant that the Father has made with the Son from before creation. Verse number 7. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. We're going to see that this first angel's message is a revival message, right? It's calling to restore these principles that sadly God, the church has forgotten since they were established and upheld by Jesus Christ in the early church and from before times. But verse number eight, and another angel followed saying, Second angel, Babylon is what? Is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made how many nations? All nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So there is this competing uh, battle between these two gospels, the everlasting gospel and the gospel of Babylon, right? But of course, prophecy says she will fall because she does not want to pre preach and give the everlasting gospel, the first angel's message accompanying it but she wants to give her own wine. And what's going to happen to those that choose to not to listen to the everlasting gospel in the first angel's message and choose to continue to drink of the wine of the Babylon? Verse number nine. Then the third angel follows, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and the image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstones in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark on his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those that who keep the commandments of God and have what? 
the faith of Jesus Christ. Amen? My loved ones, this is the last most solemn, most serious warning to the earth before God unravels and undoes this earth. This is the last message to be proclaimed before God pours out his wrath. It says here, full strength, no filter, no mercy. And the full strength of God's wrath falling is Revelation chapter 15 and 16 when it talks about the seven plagues of Revelation that are going to fall on this earth and undo, unravel the six days of creation. Now, here's where it gets very interesting. Because what happens right after this message goes out with power, what happens right after this message goes out with the power of the latter rain and the loud cry, look at what it says in Revelation chapter 14, verse number 14. Then I looked and behold a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like who? Like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a what? A sharp sickle and another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the crowd thrust in your sickle and reap for the time has come for you to reap for the harvest of the earth is what the harvest of the earth is right so he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth and the earth was what the earth was reaped so it's talking to us that the event following the preaching, the proclaiming of this everlasting gospel with the three angels message is going to be a harvest. Now, did you know that the biggest harvest that was ever uh, uh, fully uh, picked up, gathered, was, based on the Guinness Book of World Records, happened actually in 2020. It's happened in Wakaniu, Canterbury, New Zealand, a, guy, a gentleman by the name of Eric Watson. He actually yielded a crop were th that were 17 tons. Woo! This is off 21 acres over in New Zealand. 20, what, 17 tons, about 38,000 pounds of wheat was gathered. That's the biggest crop known in history, the biggest harvest known. But the most amazing harvest actually happened in 2015. There's a lady by the name of Pam Bates who was hit in Ju July 31st, 2015 with the devastating news of her husband who had a late stage cancer and he had, and the doctors just believed that he only had three months left to live. Now, this was the last thing the family ex expected. They had beautiful children, beautiful grandchildren. And the thing is that her husband was a farmer. Her, her husband's name was Carl Bates. He was a farmer. And so right when this happened, guess what was about to happen? Uh, the harvest was about to come. And so what happens was they said, who is going to gather the harvest? Who's going to gather the crops? But my loved ones, on September 25th, 2015, four, more than 40 farmers from around that city, from around the area, came out and they lent their helping hand to their brother in need. Amen? And it's known as the most amazing harvest. 450 acres, 10 combines, 20 grain carts, 40 farmers, 16 semi-trailers, and it took them 10 hours to complete the helping hand. Who says amen to that? And out of this show of immense compassion caught the attention of the whole world, right? One of their own was about to go down, and they said, we need to give him a helping hand. And out of this, actually, recently came this book, The, Amaz the Most Amazing Harvest, the man behind the story. It's the story, of course, about Pam and Carl and this situation that happens. It's a beautiful story, a beautiful Christian family. And so I'm sure that the movie will be coming out very shortly as well. But the Bible talks about the most glorious and abundant harvest that will ever happen. Amen? That is going, this is going to look pale in comparison to what is about to happen in the end. And so let's go back and let's study this Let's go verse by verse, let's go word by word, and let's go a little bit deeper into what it says here in Revelation chapter 14. Is everybody there? Revelation chapter 14, verse 14. Let's go there. Amen? Look at what it says. Then I looked, and behold, a what? A white cloud. And on the cloud, one who sat like who? Like the Son of Man. So, 
can we confirm that this event that is being talked about here is the second coming of Jesus Christ? Can we confirm that the three angels' message, God's last warning to the earth that is preparing the earth for the end, for the return of Jesus Christ, can we confirm that this is the second coming? Oh, yes, we can, very easily. Look at what it says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he comes with the clouds, and who shall see him? Every eye shall see him. Doesn't it say in verse number six that every nation, tribe, tongue, and people will hear the everlasting gospel before the end? Yes or no? Yes. And so every single human being on earth is going to be witness to this event that is going to be coming forth. Look at what it says in Math Mark chapter 13, verse 26 and 27. Then they will see the Son of Man, that's what it says here, coming in the what? In the clouds, if you go to Matthew 16, 27, it says that the clouds represent what? Angels. He's coming with all the angels, billions and billions and billions and billions of angels. And that with great power and glory, it says he's coming with the glory, his glory, the glory of the Father and the glory of all the angels. And then he will send his angels and gather together his who? His elect from the four winds or the four corners of the earth from the farthest part of the earth. In other words, my loved ones, is this not a reaping event? Yes or no? Yes, very clearly it's a reaping event, right? Somebody's going home. <laughs> Amen. Somebody's going home. <sighs> How many of you are tired of this world? Woo. It's getting old, but we're still here because there's still a lot of work to do. Amen. Revelation chapter 14, it continues to say after it says that the one on the cloud was the one, the Son of Man, of course, pointing to Jesus Christ, and it says, having on his head a what? A golden what? A golden crown, right? Revelation chapter 6 verse 2, and I looked and behold a white horse who sat on it had a bow and a what? And a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer, right? The crown is the sign of kingship, and it's talking about Jesus Christ coming with a crown. And it's a very, very special and interesting crown, too. Go with me to Revelation chapter 19. Let's go quickly to Revelation chapter 19. Look at what it says here in Revelation chapter 19. It's a parallel verse in regards to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Remember, when you study Revelation, you do not study it chronologically because you'll get all tied up. Revelation is represented or broken down in this methodology called recapitulation, right? Repeat and enlarge. It's, cyc it's cyclical in nature. It's repeating itself. And so here it gives us another perspective, another vision, another angle of the second coming. And it says in Revelation chapter 19, verse number 11. Everybody there? Amen, because I'm not. Here I go. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And his eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many, cr many what? Many crowns, right? Many crowns. Yes, he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen? Ooh, you're not excited about that? I am. And he had a name written that no one knew except himself, and he was clothed with a robe dipped in what? Dipped in blood, right? Not literally blood, but a representation of what? Of his humility, of his, of his sacrifice for his people, of his love, right? The greatest and most beautiful gift ever given in all of the universe was the greatest gift of Jesus Christ. The Father gives us the best that he had, which was his Son. And his name is called what? The Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, with white and clean, followed him on what? On white horses. Now out of his mouth comes a sharp sword. Over there in Revelation it says it's a sharp what? Sharp sickle, right? And with it he should strike the nations. And it says here in verse number 16, and he has on his robe and his thigh a name written, which is what? King of king and Lord of lords. Who says amen to that? Woo, it's the coming of Jesus Christ. There's no doubt the event that is being prescribed and described here in Revelation chapter 14, verse 14, is the return of Jesus Christ. Let's go back to that verse now, verse number 14. And having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand what? A sharp sickle, right? Now, a sickle, it might be a little challenging for most of us because we don't live 
at least not most of us nowadays, in an agricultural type of, of society, right? It's very rare, although here where we are in California, there is some, but this is what a sickle would look like, right? Just in case you've never seen one. This would be, right? The uh, farmer would grab, this is how it you, was done in the old days, it's still done this way, typically. Now they have big machines and technology that do this type of work. But you would grab the, the wheat and you would then cut it, right? The, the sickle is very interesting. In Hebrew, the word sickle means, or the root word of the word sickle in Hebrew means to separate. <laughs> I have a topic, my topic uh, is going to be later on the mark of the beast, and I'm going to talk about two groups, those that have the mark of the beast and those that have the seal of God, and there's going to be what in the end? There's going to be a separation, amen? There's going to be a separating. Who is doing the separation here? It's God. It's Christ, amen? And we'll talk about that when we get into the topic of the mark of the beast. And so the sickle, my loved ones, is just a curved iron blade, as you can see there. It's an, agri an agricultural tool, and it is primarily, notice I use the word primarily, is for reaping cereal at harvest time. Is everybody with me? Now, there are some famous sickles in history. I thought I'd just share some with you, right? You have the Grim Reaper's sickle, right? You have the, the uh, sickle that was a symbol with the hammer of the Soviet uh, Union of Soviet Republic, right? Soviet Socialist Republic, the USSR, that is extinct, even though they're trying to, trying to bring back some of it together. But do you know that the sickle was not only for harvesting? The sickle was also an instrument of war. The sickle was also an instrument of war. And if you go back and study in history, you will find that the Japanese, the Chinese, the northern central Africa, especially martial arts in Malaysia, Indonesia, and Philippines, and Indonesia, the sickle is also used as a weapon. And you know what? In Revelation 14, the same thing happens. It's used as a reaping, as a harvesting instrument. But if we go back to Revelation, let's look at it as an instrument of war. Look at it in Revelation chapter 14, verse number 17. It says, Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also having a what? A sharp sickle. How many? Another angel. Now we have two, right? And another angel came out from the altar. Now we have three. Hmm. Three angels Three angels also reaping here uh, uh, with a sickle here in Revelation chapter 17, one speaking actually, who had the power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who the sharp sickle, saying, thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully what? Fully ripe, right? This would be the harvest of the grapes or the harvest of the wicked is what it's represented here. How do we know? Let's keep on reading. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the what? Of the wrath of God, it says here. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furloughs. Now the imagery here can be a little gruesome in regards to this event, but what it's trying to portray here, or what the, uh, the, the language is trying to portray here in Revelation chapter 14 is the imagery of a battlefield, right? And the bodies are laying out out over at the battlefield, or laying over as a symbol of the total and complete destruction and annihilation of God's enemies. Those that have marked themselves inside it with Babylon versus those that are going against, that are wanting to serve and live and follow God. Same parallel verses mentioned in Luke chapter 17, verse 36 and 37. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken and the other will be left Right? And what is that? And they answered and said to him, We're Lord. And so he said to them, What? Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be what? There the eagles will be gathered. Right? And so there is this symbol, this representation again of this, that, this war that has been carried out right before the coming of Jesus Christ. And we're going to be talking about that too during these presentations. Look over with me to Revelation chapter 19, verse 17. Let's look at another parallel verse in regards to this war that is going to be carried out and the victims that are going to, those that do not side, those that side with Babylon... What is going to happen to them? Revelation chapter 19, look at what it says in verse number 17. This is another parallel verse. 
Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the what? For the supper of the great God. Revelation 19 talks about two suppers. The supper of the Lord, right? That's going to happen in heaven. But it also talks about the great supper here that is going to be what? Look at what it says. The supper of the great God that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free, slave, both small and great. Again, I know the imagery can be a little difficult, but it's trying to portray the magnitude of the destruction of the wicked when they come because the problem is that they are all the captains, all the mighty men of the earth are going to try to destroy God's people in the end. And so God is going to do a great what? A great work to put an end to this because it's going to seem that it's impossible that God's people will be overwhelmed. Woo! I'm just giving you a little teaser tonight. I'm giving you the Costco taster. You know when you go to Costco? You're happy now that the tasters are back. And then you go your little taster, and then you go around the, the aisle thinking that nobody sees you, and you come back, oh, let me have another one, right? I know. And you know why? Because I do it too. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. We just read through verse number 14. Let's read to verse number 15. Everybody there? And another angel came out of the what? Notice, from the temple, from the temple, from the temple, right? Where is these events, where are these angels coming from? From the temple. Which temple? Can't be the temple on earth. Revelation was written approximately in the year 90 after Christ. The earthly sanctuary was destroyed in the year 70 by the Romans. This is talking about the heavenly sanctuary. You study Revelation chapter 1, Christ among the lampstands, right? You study Revelation chapter 8, you see Christ in front of the altar of incense. You see Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, you see the Ark of the Covenant, right? Most holy place. The whole book of Revelation is pointing to the heavenly sanctuary, amen, which is where Christ is the real high priest, ministering on our behalf, ministering his merits, ministering his righteousness so that we can live his life here on earth too. Who says amen? No, notice this. Another angel came out of the temple crying with a what? With a loud voice. You know, I think this is why I associates so well with the three angels' message. Because it's a loud voice, a loud voice, a loud voice, and so I kind of feel emboldened that I can use my loud voice. Recently, my friend and co-worker, Tim, I saw Tim somewhere, he's sitting somewhere over there, he gave me a gift, and look at what it says. I'm not yelling, I'm Puerto Rican. <laughs> that's, I mean, that is, that's the story of my life, right? People are always like, why are you, I'm not yelling, I'm just, I'm just loud, right? I'm learning, I'm learning. So that's why I like this, because I, I, the Bible says, preach it with power, amen? Preach it boldly, preach it loudly so people can hear it. Why? Because this is the end. This is the last warning that God has given his church, that given his people to prepare the world. The ones, our neighbors, our co-workers, our, our, our family members that are not aware of this message. And God has given us this wonderful privilege to give this message out. Amen? Verse number 15. And another came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. And what did he say? Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap why? For the harvest of the earth is ripe, is ready, is mature. Amen? The word thrust there, the word in Greek, pempo, is used 77 times in Scripture. Only once is it translated to the word thrust in Revelation chapter 14. Every other time, that it is used, it is used in the context of sending or to send. So when it says thrust your sickle, what it's saying is send your sickle. Hmm. Send your word. Send the word and the sword. Amen? Now, to send what? Look at what it says here. It says, what? For the time has come. I like to say, the time has finally come. Amen? 
My loved ones, God has been waiting for 6,000 years to put an end to this world of sin, of death, of sorrow, of crying, and pain. And something very special has finally happened here in Revelation chapter 14, verse number 14 forward. Something very special has happened here on the earth that the time has come to put an end to this. Amen? And the question is, what is it that has come? It's very clear that what has come is what? The harvest is ready. Now, the question is, we'll be answering some of those questions today. We'll be answering some of those questions in the upcoming presentations. What is the harvest? What will make the harvest ripe and ready? Why has it taken so long? How and when will it be ready? What is my part in this harvest? Will I be part of the harvest? Or will I be sifted and shaken out? Hmm. Beautiful explanation. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, I think, is probably the clearest point where Jesus explains in very clear terms exactly what is being talked about in Revelation chapter 13. Revelation, I mean, in, yeah, in Revelation chapter 14. Go with me to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And we are going to go to verse number 24. It's the parable of the wheat and the tares. All right? Wheat and the tares. We let the Bible explain itself. Who says Amen. Notice how I'm going from Scripture to Scripture, right? We're letting Scripture explain itself. And I'm only giving you a few verses because of time. I can, over, I can overwhelm you, if some of you know, with Bible verses and Bible verses coming. When, I remember one time I was in Guatemala preaching a series, and this journalist came, and the journalist came, and he was so amazed, he put me on the first page of the newspaper, and it said, Evangelist Carlos Munoz uses more than 50 Bible verses in each presentation. It was just Bible and Bible and Bible and Bible. I thought that was pretty cool, right? Matthew chapter 13, verse 24, look at what it says. Another parable he put forth, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, and while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. So now, why is there going to be a sickle? Why is there going to be a separation? Because there's what in that harvest? There's wheat and there's tares, so they have to be separated, right? But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servant of the owner came and said to him, Sir, do you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them, right? You got to let them grow out, and eventually the wheat will grow up, become white, and will bend over, right? I think it's a beautiful representation. Let both, greet, grow, uh, let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat in my, in my what? In my barn. Now let's go to the explanation in verse, <clears throat> in verse number 34. Jesus says, I'm sorry, verse number 37. He who sow, now he's going to explain the parable. He who sows the good seed is the son of man. Again, Revelation 14. The field is what? The world. And good seeds are the sons and daughters of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. We talked about this, this separation that is going to happen right before the return of Jesus Christ. There's going to be a separation. We'll talk further about that in the upcoming presentations. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the... Now we know that this harvest in Revelation 14 is talking about the end of this age, the end of this world, Right? And the reapers are who? The angels. That's why we saw in, in, in Matthew 24. I'm sorry, no, we read uh, Mark chapter 13. It says that he sends his angels to gather the elect from the four corners of the earth. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and all those who practice what? lawlessness or those that transgress the law or trample on his holy law, the Ten Commandments, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. That's why I said, are we going to be gathered up and taken to the heavenly storehouse or are we going to be burned? We'll talk about that later when we talk about the mark of the beast and the image of the beast, among other things. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, and he who has ears to hear do what? How many of you have ears? Let me see. Raise your hand if you have ears. 
All right, so that means this message is for you and for me, amen? This message is very, very clear, my loved ones. Again, there are two groups here, right? Just like there's two suppers, there's two groups. Just like in the Ark of Noah, there's those inside of the Ark and those that are outside of the Ark. Notice this. The harvest is the time of separation and rewarding. Amen? The last message of warning in the three angels' message that is going out to the earth, to all the people will do what? will ripen and prepare the faithful for eternal salvation, for the final atonement and reconciliation. But at the same time, this same message will harden the hearts of many and cause many to do what? To continue in their unbelief and be destroyed. Now, notice it says here in verse number 29, it says, but he said, no, lest you gather up the tares and also uproot the wheat with them. Going back again to the sickle, right? The sickle is doing this separating. And so we see in Matthew chapter 13 and in Revelation chapter 14, it shows us that the coming of Jesus Christ is explained in the agricultural context of this event, right? The reaping of the harvest of the wheat to take in into the storehouse. Now, here's my question. In this agricultural context in which we find this story and a number of other parables, we ask ourselves, what is that that facilitates or what is that that makes possible or what is that that is to be used to begin the process for the sowing for eventually the harvest to come forth? What is that thing that has to happen on the front of the harvest? What is that thing that has to happen on the front of the sowing? What is that called? The early rain. The early rain. Watch this. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 9 and 10. And you shall count seven weeks for yourself. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time you begin to what? To put the sickle to the grain. And you shall keep the feast of weeks to the Lord your God. What is the feast of weeks? If you prophet prophetically, what is the feast of weeks talking about? The seven feast days are what? Are seven prophecies, right? It's a prophetic timeline, the seven feast days. And so the feast of weeks is known as what? Pentecost. Go with me to Acts chapter 2. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. The feast of weeks, seven weeks times seven, 49, 50, Pentateuco, right? 50. Go with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And when you're there, say amen. When the day of, verse number one, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Day of Pentecost, feast of weeks, right? 49. And what happened? You know the story. The Holy Spirit descended the early rain. The church went out with the power, right? They started off with the power in this context of the gift of tongues or the gift of languages to be able to preach the gospel to all those from all these different nations that were there, that were there for the Feast of Pentecost so that they can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. The purpose was at that early stage was to give that, that gift on the, on the upfront so that others can hear the message. But look at what it says in verse number 13. The others mocked them and said they are full of what? Of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to the men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But that is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. So who is Peter going to quote now? The prophet Joel. And what does he say? It shall come to pass that in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and young men shall see visions, and old men shall dream what? Dreams. But notice, he's quoting the prophet Joel, and he's talking about the signs and wonders, and look at what he says in verse number 20. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be what? Shall be saved. Now, Christ came the first time with the purpose of sowing the seed of the everlasting gospel, of the everlasting covenant, so that it can ripe. Now, if we don't have time, but if you want to, go study the book of Joel. 
The book of Joel is absolutely parallel to everything that we're talking about. And it talks about the great day of the Lord. It talks about the, the rain, both the early rain and the latter rain. It talks about the wrath of God. It talks about God's people standing on Mount Zion as God is saving them from the incoming attack of Babylon that is coming. That is what it's all pointing to, that what it's all about. Now, here's the question. If that was the early rain was the element, was what the instrument that God used to prepare the heart, to prepare the seed for the final harvest, what then is going to be the instrument that is going to mature and finish the process of reaping? What is that called then? The latter rain. So early rain, Pentecost, early church. Latter rain, we just saw it right before the coming of Jesus Christ. In other words, we can conclude then that what proceeds, what initiates, what sustains, and what accompanies the work that is going to be done right before the coming of Jesus Christ, which is the, the latter rain, the loud cry of that harvest, what accompanies that latter rain is what? Is the three angels' message. The three angels' message is what is going to be hand in hand with the latter rain, with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to what? To empower, to give God's people boldness to face persecution, to face oppression, to face what's coming. Because if we don't have that power, we will not be able to stand. God, in his infinite mercy, knows that we need a little extra kick, a little extra juice, right? The fourth angel. I like to call it the three angels' message on steroids as God is preparing us for this wonderful event. Look at what it says here in the book, uh, Acts of the Apostles. The latter rain falling near the close of the season ripens. What does it do? It ripens the grain and prepares it for the sickle. The Lord employs these operations of nature to represent the work of the Holy Spirit. As the dew and the rain are given first to cause the seed to germinate and then to ripen the harvest, so the Holy Spirit is given to carry, to carry forward from one stage to another the process of what? Spiritual growth. We can call this sanctification. Amen? Sanctification is ongoing justification. They're hand in hand. They work together. Notice what it says. The ripening of the grain represents the completion of the work of God's grace. Where? So they, stop pointing at other people when you're talking about the three angels' message. Look at these Babylonians. Because you might not be in structural Babylon, but you might still be a Babylonian. And you might still have a Babylonian heart. This message is not to be pointing. This message is to what? Is to point. The Bible was not given so that we can hit other people with them the, over the head with a Bible. The Bible is given so that I can hit myself over it, my head with it. Is everybody with me? Look at this. By the power of the Holy Spirit, and this is where it gets beautiful, the moral image of God is to be perfected in the character. We are to be wholly transformed into the likeliness of Christ. That is what God has been waiting for. That's what it's talking about. The harvest is ready. Why? Because we have finally put ourselves in a position to let the Holy Spirit finish the work of sanctification. Finish the work. And this is what's contemplated in Revelation chapter 7, right? In Revelation chapter 7, it says that the four angels are holding back the what? The four winds of the earth. Why? Why are they holding back the four winds of the earth? Let's go there. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, I think this is crucial to understand because we think about the second coming, Jesus is coming, yes, but what is the preparation that I need to be doing? What is my part? How do I know if I am going to be a wheat or a tear, a goat or a sheep? How do I know? What if I think I'm fine? Well, that's the beauty of the Bible. The Bible points it to, to that. At the end of chapter 6, it talks about the great day of the wrath of the Lord, the second coming of Christ. And then it says in verse 7-1, after these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice. To who? The four angels, the four corners of the earth. Again, this message granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, and the trees. Never. Is that what it says? Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their what? On their forehead. Now the question is, what does this sealing? We're looking, these are, this is all parallel, 
right? We're confirming what we're reading. We're looking at different parts. We're confirming this, that this ripening, that this preparation is character preparation. It's character restoration. It's character perfection. Revelation, what does that seal represent? Go with me quickly to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. I'm going to give you a little, another Costco taster of my presentation when I talk about the mark of the beast and the seal of God. Revelation chapter 14. What is that seal on the forehead? Look at what it says here. And then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written where? On their forehead. In Revelation chapter 7 it says it's the seal on their forehead. Revelation chapter 14 says it's the father's name on their forehead. I have a question. What does the name represent in scripture? Character. Amen? Amen. So we are reflecting what? The character of Christ. We are reflecting the mind of Christ. The image of Christ has been restored in us when we lost it back in Eden. Is everybody with me? And that is, my loved ones, that is what God is waiting for. That's why he says he's holding back, waiting for what? Waiting for us to let the Holy Spirit do the work of character restoration. That's what he's waiting for this whole time. That's why it says the time has come. God says, finally, my people have let my spirit finish the work that he wants to do. Woo! Oh, we're just warming up. Time is up. This is what God wants to do. The gospel, it says in Romans chapter 1, the gospel of Christ is the power of God to salvation. And then it says in verse number 17 that that power is the righteousness of God revealed. God, the Father, manifested his righteousness through Jesus Christ. Christ did not depend on his human nature, on his human strength, on his human intelligence. Christ always depended 100% daily, consistently, and constantly on the Father. And the Father dwelt in the Son through the Holy Spirit, my loved ones, but now the Bible tells us that the Son wants to dwell in us too. And the righteousness of the Father manifested through the Son, Jesus Christ. Now God wants to manifest and reveal that same righteousness in you and me. Christ dwelling in me, the hope of glory. Amen? That's the blessed hope that we're waiting for. That's what God wants, that the glory of his character will be revealed through all of us to cover the whole earth. That whole earth will be witness to the power and the glory of God. And what is that glory and that power? It's his character. We finish with this quote. The divine husband looks for a harvest as the reward of his labor and sacrifice. Notice this. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he puts in the sickle and, became, and because the harvest is come. This is Christ's object lessons. Is it not talking about the harvest? Yes or no? Is it talking about Revelation chapter 14? Yes or no? Now look at what she says is that fruit that is going to come forth in the harvest. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. This is what God has been waiting for this whole time. It's happened here or there sporadically, but in the end, the whole earth will be covered. Imagine not one person, Jesus Christ, the devil could not stand him for three and a half years, the righteousness of God revealed in him. Imagine tens, hundreds, thousands, millions of people manifesting, revealing the character of Christ. Woo! Christ is waiting with that longing desire for the manifestation of himself in us. And when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Amen? That's what he's waiting. Now, have we seen something like this? Yeah, we did. Matthew 24, 14, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nation, and then the end will come. This is, isn't that parallel? Now I put these two together. I thought I like to play around. I put these two together and look what I came up with. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, now Matthew 24, then this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, Christ's oblique lessons, then he will come to claim the man as his own, and then the end will come. Woo! Perfect coordination between spirit of prophecy and the word of God. Amen? 
That's my loved ones. It was God is waiting for. He's waiting for this glorious event. He's waiting for this glorious moment. And we think that, oh, this harvest, this amazing harvest that happened in this country in 2015, my loved ones, that is a beautiful event, how they came together. What in the end God says, right before I send my son, my people will come together too, and they shall be one as it was in Pentecost, and I will pour out my Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and my glory, my character, my love, my mercy, my patience will be manifested in my people. Amen. My question to you tonight is, how many of you want to say, I want to be part of that harvest in the end? I want to be part of those that get stand up in the name of Jesus Christ. If you say, Lord, I want to be ready. If you are here during these 13 presentations, we are going to be talking about this wonderful message that is preparing the world. This is what this is about. It's about preparing for this event. It's about getting ready for this. Who says amen? I don't know about you, but I'm excited. We're just getting warmed up. Praise the Lord for the message he's given us in these end times. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you for the blessing. Thank you, Father, for giving us the privilege and the honor to be able to finish and put an end to this world. But not on our own strength, not on our own power. It's through your Holy Spirit because we're only less 0.25% of the populations. And so this tells us that this message that is going to reach the whole world, every tribe, tri tribe, nation, tongue, and people will be a powerful, powerful manifestation of you. Not of us, of you, but you in us and through us. Help us, Father, as we prepare and uh, we start off these 13 presentations on the three angels' message so that this might be our revival and reformation as the message is meant to be in our lives. We thank you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.